Hi, my name is Paco, and uh, I'm grateful to get to present here today. The title is Thinking Sparse and Dense. Now, uh, all the slides here, they're online. Uh, frankly, there's a lot of links in them, so if there are parts that seem interesting, you want to chase down some primary sources or tutorials, um, hopefully there's a lot of good resources for you there. Just briefly about me, I made a mistake of studying AI in grad school about 40 years ago. Then I went off and spent years working in an area called neural networks, including hardware accelerators. Uh, and then I was a guinea pig for something new called AWS. And uh, I've also been involved in some open source projects. Um, these days, I do a lot of work with uh, machine learning, knowledge graph, and natural language in open source. So this talk is about uh, a recent report, just came out last month, uh, on Manning. Uh, Dean Wampler and I wrote this. It's called Hardware is greater than software is greater than process. And there's a free download if you follow this link here. Um, we did this uh, working with uh, some of the software leads for open source projects at NVIDIA, and also experts in terms of leveraging GPUs, uh, various areas of machine learning and graph analytics, et cetera. So the gist is that really from a software perspective, as a developer, um, how can you make the most out of the hardware that's available? That's the gist here. And you know you need to develop intuition about how hardware works and how to leverage that to optimize applications. Uh, you don't have to be expert, but understanding some of the fundamentals can really take you a long way and maybe even knock down you know orders of magnitude increase in performance to enable things that you just didn't even think were possible before. That can open up entirely new areas of applications. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, you know, given what we're showing here, it doesn't imply a lot of changes for the data scientists and data engineers. Really, it's more about changing the process that's used and particularly like continuous integration. Um, from an engineering perspective, how can you set up better CI so that the, the data workflows in general work better? So yeah, this is about a post more law world. Uh, what are the implications on data science and, and data engineering? And the report really goes into a lot more detail. Uh, the talk is just tip of the iceberg. But the thing that we noticed <clears throat> was that for the past 20 years or so since publication of the Agile Manifesto, um, there's been this idea that process is something that's, that's very general. It's like an umbrella. It applies to all kinds of different projects. Software is, you know, abstraction layers. It's also very general. Uh, it's largely agnostic about the hardware. And then hardware is something that's a very low level. And those are resources that just keep getting better, faster, cheaper, thanks to Moore's Law. Except that all three of those points are wrong. Hardware has been evolving more rapidly than software. Software has been evolving more rapidly than process. And we need to understand how to adapt to that, how to update the parts that are, that are lagging. So uh, I do want to cover a brief history and, uh, you know, really th this is super overview, but there's some good links to primary sources here. And the idea is that going back for the past 25 years or so, um, about every five years, there's this bump in technology that has um, a lot of ramifications for the software engineering side of AI applications. And so, you know, if you roll back to like Q3 of 1997, there were four teams working independently on horizontal scale out. Um, Greg Lendon at Amazon, Randy Shoup at eBay, on and on. And they came up with, you know, scale out mostly on Linux boxes, uh, but it established this kind of, uh, well, it, it really set the stage for big data and cloud computing, but it established this thing that Andrew Ng calls a virtuous cycle of big data leading into machine learning. And then in 2001, Leo Brayman uh, published the infamous Two Cultures paper that, you know, uh, heralded machine learning and production. Um, but at the same time, the Agile Manifesto was getting published. And, and frankly, those two groups couldn't be more disjoint. They, they were like aliens to each other. Um, and then 2006, I, I was fortunate to be a guinea pig for the launch of something new called AWS. Um, at the same time, roughly, Intel was producing the first commodity multi-core chips. Uh, NumPy was released. People started talking about this thing called MapReduce, on and on. And then you roll the clock out to 2012, AlexNet, uh, the paper was published that really opened up deep learning. And then in 2017, you had embedded language models were first released, um, learned indexes paper, uh, and just in general, software 
Um, so you see like machine learning making major incursions on what had been software engineering territory. A lot of implications of that. But at the same time, you also saw Intel, after decades, falter on execution of 10 nanometer features. Uh, so here's a, a good visual of what happened over decades. There was exponential increase, uh, Moore's Law, and then around 2005, it starts to flatten out. But at the same time, the cost of producing, uh, creating a fab to make chips was increasing exponentially. And in fact, it's up to like $15 billion to make a new fab these days. And at the same time, machine learning resources, the consumption of resources was outpacing the advances in hardware. So there should be red flags going off all across the board. Also through this arc, you have to understand the cultural aspects of this. Um, if you read the Agile Manifesto, notice that the word data doesn't get used even once. That's crazy. Okay, there's been generations of software developers who've been taught about, you know, fast iteration on the code base. Okay, coding is preeminent, data is secondary. But in contrast, there's a different worldview where learning is preeminent and data is a competitive differentiator. And those two things don't reconcile. Okay, um, the latter gained first mover advantage in terms of AI adoption. And uh, Ben Lorica and I have been writing some reports. Others have come out from MIT Sloan and, and McKinsey and Global Institute, et cetera. But really, since about 2017, we're tracking how there's this Peloton effect that the firms that are investing in AI are investing even more aggressively. And meanwhile, more than half of the Global 2000 is years away from even getting started. So the projections are that by mid-decade, we'll see a rather large acquisition event where the laggards just basically become acquisition targets. To, so to understand this, hardware is evolving rapidly. And the best resource I will assign, uh, go out and study. It's called the Geopolitics series. It's part of the Next Billion Seconds podcast by uh, my friend Mark Pesci. And uh, really, really brilliant reporting here. Great history, a lot of links. It will set the stage for what's going on here. One of the proof points definitely is in terms of Cerebrus. And so, you know, they've come out with, uh, they, they broke world records as far as wafer scale. Um, and regardless of where this chip goes and gets used, uh, I'm sure they'll become quite wealthy just based off the patents on wafer scale. But, you know, really amazing 1.2 trillion transistors on a single chip. And you see them holding chips. I got to hold one of those chips. In general, NVIDIA, you know, shocked the world by buying ARM. And so now NVIDIA has three major families of hardware. They've, of course, got the GPUs they've been doing, but now with ARM, they have x86 processors. And they also have this sort of data center on a chip kind of processor. The idea being you can combine the three and produce basically boards that you know, are equivalent to what we would have called supercomputers. Uh, really fantastic work because they're looking at this evolution of hardware and software together. What happens when your application is too big or too complex to run on your laptop or on a single server. And you got a couple choices. You can scale up, which means you get a bigger server, you buy bigger licenses. Or you can do scale out, which means you do some trade-offs and, and distribute the data and the compute across multiple servers. So the history of things like MPI and Hadoop and Spark and now Dask, these are generations of scale out. And they do imply trade-offs in terms of overhead costs, always, and risks, always. If you want to see some examples of distributed design patterns in Python, uh, check out my tutorial there. The 1990s, MPI, uh, that was spaghetti code. I mean, it got the job done, but it was spaghetti code. In the 2000s, in the aughts, you saw Hadoop and Spark and all. You know, and the idea was to leverage commodity clusters, but you had these kind of synchronization barriers. You had a map phase or deuce phase, et cetera. And that led to, you know, problems with uh, asymmetries in data where you could have, like, really low cluster utilization while the stragglers finished. And then you get into, you know, 2012 and beyond that, you start to see the, the deep learning kind of workloads where really it required new hardware. It required point to point communications were quite different in terms of the IO fabric. And so you see new things like, you know, uh, TensorFlow and Ray and all these addressing them. There's a great talk on these lines by Jeff Dean, uh, 2013 at the Bay Area ACM meetup, going in detail about how they have these workloads, they have a new new generations of hardware, particularly the IO, 
in their data center is new. And they're addressing these problems they have with really large scale neural networks, training them and using them. And it isn't about the compute, it's, it's about latency. It's, it's about the bandwidth. If you read between the lines, Jeff Dean is really talking about what would become known as TensorFlow. But there's even more recent work on this that you know I think Evan Oldridge, who's uh, leading the Merlin project at NVIDIA, has sort of picked up the ball and is running with it. So let's break it down in terms of concepts. Um, and first off, I'll put up this straw man for like a, a general pattern for data workflows. In data science in general, there, there are two things we're really looking at. One is we're going from unstructured data to refining into more and more structure. And then along with that, we're managing and leveraging dimensionality. Those are the two big things we manage in data science. And the typical workflows will have, you know, your data prep, your feature engineering, training, evaluation, deployment. And, and we can just, like I say, use this as a straw man. So I want to introduce this idea of thinking sparse and dense. So there, there are trade-offs in different stages of workflows, and they're really crucial for being able to leverage the hardware appropriately. Sparse kinds of, of work, these are typically in the early stages where you're doing data prep and joins. Typically, these are bandwidth limited. And, you know, I, this work might be done off in CPU land, or if we're talking about deep learning, um, you know, you, you struggle with this when you're doing your loss function calculations. But the sparse side is the symbolic side. This is what the stakeholders and the customers understand. So whenever we're talking with customers, we're off in sparse land. The dense side of this, though, is typically your compute limited parts. If we're talking about deep learning, those would be your convolution layers, for example. Um, these are the parts that are readily vectorized, you know, so like in, in the training stages of a pipeline. And it's important to understand the distinctions between these and use them appropriately. There's a lot of math to guide this. So for instance, uh, you know, we can apply algebraic graph theory and abstract algebra to do transformations and inverse transformations between a general data object, which is one form of graph or another, versus an algebraic object, which might be a vector or a matrix or a tensor. Or... There's this approach called non-negative matrix factorization. And the idea is you can project graph relations into a matrix and then do factorization decomposition techniques. Um, I will point to Tim Davis uh, at uh, Texas A&M, sort of the grandfather of this area. Um, most of the production libraries that are used for number crunching uh, in, in terms of factorization, uh, you know, he's had a hand in writing them. Um, and then there's also David Gleick at Purdue, formerly at Stanford, really uh, brilliant work in terms of deconstructing page rank and other types of algorithms for this. So just as a real quick ILO, uh, you know, working with PageRank, you come from different sources, you parse them, you've indexed them, you go and run the graph algorithm to rank, and then you work with inverted index to produce some sort of results. So you're going from sparse to dense to sparse. Okay, that's an example of what we're talking about. Uh, Tim Davis did a paper a couple of years ago, and this is taking a look, uh, you know, of course, Neo4j is really popular as a graph database. Uh, but this is taking a look at something called Redis Graph, which I really like. And on the same hardware, same data, same algorithm, Redis Graph runs approximately two orders of magnitude faster than Neo4j. And it's because Redis Graph is using something called Graph Blast. They're, they're doing the dense thinking and the transformations from sparse to dense and back. They're doing that right. Neo4j, eh, not so much. So dense is important. However, you know, sometimes we have to blend the symbolic and the numeric. Uh, when we're working with graph algorithms, when we're working with deep learning, uh, that's typically requiring numeric representation. But other times we have to work in the symbolic, the sparse side. So if you're doing compliance audits, if you're doing uh, rules based on domain expertise, explainable AI, any kind of work in human in the loop or natural language, this is where the symbolic side, the sparse side comes in. There is a term emerging called neurosymbolic AI, um, and I've linked to a, an excellent paper uh, by Neil Thompson at MIT. Um, also keep in mind uh, techniques such as active learning and self-supervised learning, which really play into this. There's a project, uh, I'm one of the committers on a project called KG Lab. We explore these ideas in more detail. So a general pattern for data workflows, here's our four steps of going from sparse to dense, crunch, back to sparse. Um, and yeah, this is really a lot of the, the thesis of, of the report. Now, let's talk about languages. Python has become a lingua franca for working with data analytics. 
largely because of C++ under the hood, the history going back to 2006, 2007, you know, they were doing work with medical imaging, a lot of number crunching, and historically a lot of work close to the hardware. But yet at the same time, the language provides easy to, to use features. Uh, it's very concise. Uh, you know, Alan Downey uh, points out that in analysis of many papers, uh, often the Python implementation of an algorithm is actually more compact than the pseudocode that was published in the paper. <laughs> the Python language is very forgiving, but it also it allows a lot of deep access to the hardware. However, at the same time, Java happened, and that pushed people even further away from hardware. So our point is that better programmers write idiomatic code that hardware can optimize, with all apologies to Martin Fowler. Even so, there's a disconnect. Programming languages are really good at representing floats and lists and strings and all that. They aren't so good at defining formally where is it in the code that you need to, to focus on sparse, symbolic work on distributed software, scale up. Versus where in the code do you need to focus on vectorizing, dense numerical work, probably running on a hardware accelerator? Okay, that's missing. That is a software engineering problem. It must be done at the workflow level. It's the work we have ahead. For this, you can kind of think of Python as like a really good DSL for C++. So how to do this? Well, right now, one thing to note is that there are four key abstractions that just are missing in the high-level languages. But we use them over and over. Um, so the, the report goes into much more detail, but definitely data frames, graphs, pipelines, and tensors. We need to have better support. Until we have better support in high-level languages, you need to understand how to work with these kinds of design patterns and how to use them idiomatically. Because that's really the only way that the hardware can have any hope of optimizing for, for what's going on in the data workflows. Well, I highly recommend use design patterns, calm code. Uh, uh, Vincent Warmerdown will be speaking here outstanding work. Um, and just in general, Stack Overflow has a lot of great content for this. Use comprehensions, use type annotations, but more importantly, use pre-commit hooks to really enforce, encourage all of the above uh, across teams. And that's part of your CI. And that allows, you know, the low level stuff, Arrow and Kupai and Numba and Cython and all that to do the heavy lifting. Use idiomatic programming. Also, learn how to use the profiling tools and learn about using profiling in depth with an iterative process. Start with a, a coarse grain analysis in Python, look at your, your call stack, look at your memory objects, and then drill down as you start to identify bottlenecks. You can drill down, there's great tools all the way down to hardware timelines. Iterate with this notion of like inspect, visualize, analyze, take action. And there's some excellent tutorials here. Here's a, a selection of uh, profiling tools that I like in Python, uh, particularly Oddgraph, SnakeViz, PyInstrument, and I, I've got a tutorial if you want to check out some examples of using these. The other thing is that as you're making trade-offs and you know doing the software engineering work, you need to understand how to measure. Yeah, what we've seen is that time to market has become one of the most important metrics uh, in terms of success or failure for AI projects. But yet at the same time, working on data science teams, you see, you know, people spend so much of their time waiting, waiting for ETL jobs to complete, for models to train, for visualizations to render. With appropriate use of the hardware, you can cut out those wait states. And that leads to more success at the project level. So here's our five-step program that's described in more detail in the, uh, in the report. And just to summarize, also, a few things keep me up at night. Really, co-evolution of hardware and software is becoming super crucial. Um, and I will reference back to Evan Oldridge. Also, you know, world powers are having conflict over chip supply chain bottlenecks and related cyber attacks. And I'm hopeful that that doesn't go further. Also, we're going to need much better work on schedulers. And to that point, you know, it's interesting the the South Polar craters on the moon are the coldest points of the solar system, some of the coldest points. Also, they have perpetual sunlight. Um, so, you know, this would be a really good place to drop large clusters of quantum devices. And uh, it's, it's a great approach to like mitigate climate change that we just move our, our cloud computing off to the moon with renewable resources. Uh, is there any organization that can handle both cloud computing and commercial space travel? I don't know. <laughs>